My name is Jay Jonas. I'm a deputy chief in the New York City Fire Department. I live in Goshen, New York. On September 11th, I was the captain of Ladder Company 6, which is located in the Chinatown section of Lower Manhattan. I was a captain there for just about eight years, and uh, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, the World Trade Center would be my last response as a captain of Ladder 6. I'd be promoted five days later. It was a routine morning. We were getting ready for the day tour. I worked the night before and I was continuing on duty. And uh, all my firefighters were checking tools and checking masks and checking the apparatus, make, making sure we're ready to respond to any kind of emergency. And uh, just before uh, 9 o'clock, about quarter to 9, there was a, uh, we heard a loud jet trail go across the sky and we heard a loud explosion. We didn't really know what that was. Uh, my house watchman was a man named Ray Hayden, and he yelled into the intercom that uh, a plane just crashed into the World Trade Center, and we responded immediately. And uh, responding into the World Trade Center, there wasn't a lot of traffic. The, the traffic that we were avoiding was pedestrian traffic of people running away from the World Trade Center. And once we got to the, the World Trade Center, we parked our apparatus uh, right near the front door of the North Tower. And uh, as we were dismounting the fire truck, pieces of the building started to fall and struck our apparatus. And uh, we sought shelter underneath the pedestrian bridge that connects the World Trade Center and the World Financial Center across West Street. And we went back and forth a couple times until we assembled all the tools that we needed for this type of fire. And uh, we looked up, we didn't see anything coming, and I yelled out, all right, ready, set, go, and we ran to the front door. Once we got to the front door of the World Trade Center, there were two badly burned people at the front door. They were in the elevators when the plane hit, and the jet fuel and the vapors went down the elevator shaft and ignited with these people in the elevators. And uh, But now I was faced with my first decision. Do I stop and help these two people, or do I go upstairs and help maybe 50 people? And I saw a couple paramedics coming our way and I just waved to them and I pointed to the people on the ground and we entered the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And once we were inside, uh, I saw a, a guy who was the captain of Ladder 3, this guy named Patty Brown. And he, uh, he had his company with him and he says, don't even bother reporting in, they're just gonna send you upstairs. And I says, uh, let, me, let me go in just to re you know, get our name recorded that we're here. And uh, I went to the command post, and it was being run by two uh, chiefs, a battalion chief named Joe Pfeiffer and a deputy chief named uh, Pete Hayden. And uh, there was a line of officers waiting to get their orders. And so I was online waiting to get mine. And I was surrounded by firefighters from Rescue One and a lieutenant from Engine 55. And uh, all of a sudden we saw a large black shadow on the ground, and we heard another loud explosion, and we saw pieces of flaming debris falling down outside. We didn't know what that was. And uh, a man came running in from the outside. He said, a second plane has just hit the second tower. And uh, now we knew how bad this day was going to be. We, uh, we were, you know, if we thought that this was going to be a, uh, this was a horrible uh, accident, it wasn't. It was, we were under attack by someone. and. Uh, once we had the uh, um, once we realized that uh, you know the second plane has hit the second tower, that opened up all kinds of possibilities. Is it going to be a, a third plane? Is it going to be a fourth plane? We didn't know. And then uh, after that plane hit the second tower, the the lobby went silent. And uh, a fireman from Rescue One looked up and he said, we may not live through today. And uh, we stopped and we acknowledged his, his statement and we took the time to shake each other's hands and wish each other good luck and I hope I see you later and it's nice knowing you. And uh, out of all those guys I was surrounded by when the second plane hit the South Tower, they all perished, they all died. I was, I'm the only one that's alive. And now it was my turn. It's my turn to get orders from uh, uh, Chief Hayden, and 
I, I looked at him, I told him, I says, you know, a second plane has just hit the South Tower. And the only reason why I said that is thinking he would send me there. And he says, I know, I know. And he says, just take your guys upstairs in this building for search and rescue and do the best you can. And I gave him a salute and I went over to my guys and I says, all right, here's the deal. It's a raw deal, but this is what we have to do. I said, uh, we have to go upstairs for search and rescue in this building. And we can't use the elevators because they've been exposed to fire already. And uh, the last thing I told them was, they're trying to kill us, boys. I said, let's go. To their credit, every one of them. I said, all right, Cap, we're with you. Let's go. And uh, we proceeded to the B stairway uh, in the North Tower, which was the closest stairway. And uh, as we're about to hit the stairway, my youngest firefighter, Sal D'Agostino, uh, spoke to me, he says, hey, Cap, so I wonder where the Air Force is. And it was, struck me when he said it, uh, I, I had been to thousands of fires in my career at that point, and I never once wondered where the Air Force was going ahead of fire building stairway. And uh, so we started our climb, and our target floor was around the 90th floor. Uh, because that's about where the uh, looking at the building as we're responding in that we, we could see that's where the holes were from the airplane and uh, so we, you know we still had all our gear on and all the carrying all our tools and equipment and uh, so every fireman is uh, laden down with about 100 pounds of gear and protective equipment so I felt we could take this 10 floors at a time with do 10 floors, catch your breath, do another 10. And that way we would have some energy to fight the fire once we got to the 90th floor. And um, so we were wor working out pretty well. As we're climbing the stairs, there's a row of civilians coming down the stairs and a row of firemen and policemen going up the stairs. And um, we made it to the uh, 27th floor and I turned around to make sure I had everybody with me. And uh, it's easy enough to get lost in that building without a fire. And uh, I turned around, I was missing two guys. So I told the guys I had with me, stay here and I'll go try to find the other two. And they were only like a floor behind us. And uh, once we all got together, the guys who I had left on the 27th floor were taking a break. You know, they were getting a drink of water and catching their breath. And I said, all right, let's, uh, next time we'll go on to the uh, 40th floor and we'll stick to our 10th floor plan. And uh, while I was there, I saw a couple people I knew. One of them was Andy Fredericks. Uh, he was separated from his, his company. And uh, he said that he had, his, he had just come back from medical leave and his, his knee was killing him. So, uh, and, uh, the next guy I saw that I, I said hello to was uh, Captain Billy Burke of Engine 21. And he was uh, one time was a fireman under my command when I was a lieutenant. So we knew each other pretty well. And uh, all of a sudden we felt and heard something that nobody had ever felt or heard before. Uh, we heard a loud roar outside. Our building swayed violently back and forth and, uh, and the lights went out. And uh, we, they came on after about 30 seconds. And I looked at Captain Burke, I said, Billy, you go check the south windows, I'll check the north windows, we'll come back here and we'll compare notes. And um, I couldn't see anything. I just saw white dust press against the glass. So I made it back to the stairway and he's walking towards me with a funny look on his face. This is, so what happened? Thinking he would say like a piece of our building fell off or something. And uh, he said, the South Towers just collapsed. Knowing what that meant, that thousands of people right next door to us were just killed. And uh, so, you know, it, it didn't take uh, much of a genius to figure out that uh, our lives were in imminent peril. You know, that uh, the building, the sister building to the one we were in, got hit after our building had collapsed. And uh, so I, uh, I
turned around and I looked at my, my firefighters and uh, I said, all right guys, if that one can go, this one can go, it's time for us to get out of here. And uh, they, they didn't respond, they were balking. And uh, I said, well, so let's go, it's time to go. And uh, it turns out they didn't hear the conversation I had with Captain Burke that the, the South Tower had just collapsed. So they, all they knew was they just climbed 27 floors with 100 pounds of gear and equipment on their backs and I'm telling them, all right, we're going back down the stairs. But we, we started heading down the stairs and we're going at a normal gait. Now keep in mind, I have information that they don't have. I know what kind of danger we're in. And this is the scariest part of the day for me is the anticipation of something really bad hap going to happen. And they seem a, a, a lot more cavalier than I am. You know, they, they seem very relaxed and, uh, but I don't know that they don't know. So if you can follow that. And uh, so we head down the stairs and we got to around the 20th floor and there's a woman standing in the doorway, she's crying. And uh, it was Josephine Harris. She was one week shy of her 60th birthday. And uh, we didn't know it at the time, but she was involved in a car accident, a car versus pedestrian accident a couple of weeks before 9-11. That's why she wasn't walking well. And um, one of my firemen, Tommy Falco, looks at me, turns around, looks at me, he says, hey, Cap, what do you want to do with her? And I'm thinking to myself, you're being pretty free with our time. Every second that we waste is one second closer to us not getting out of here. But then I looked at her and she was in absolute distress. And uh, I said, all right, bring her with us. And one of my other firemen, Billy Butler, a big, strong guy. I said, Billy, take your equipment off, your, your mask and your, give your tools to the other guys and we'll put her armor on your shoulders and we'll continue down the stairs which is what we did. But now our re retreat was greatly slowed by doing that. And, uh, you know, I'm, my, in my mind, I'm screaming that we're not gonna get out of here, you know? And uh, like I said, the guys in front of me, all my guys are in front of me and, and they're calm. And so I'm, I'm as calm as I could be. And I, w I would whisper into Billy Butler's ear, I says, Billy, can you move a little faster, please? And he says, okay, Cap. You know, and he goes a little bit faster. And uh, as we're coming down the stairs, I'm see seeing and hearing other um, examples of courage and heroism uh, that Captain Patty Brown I saw in the lobby. Uh, Chief Hayden got on the radio and said, Command post to ladder three, get out of the building, gives him a direct order. And Patty Brown gets on the radio and he says, this is the officer of ladder company three. I'm on the 44th floor and I refuse the order. I got too many, too many burned people with me and I'm not leaving them, which was uh, remarkable that he did that, you know. I never heard that before or since. And we continued down this, you know, all of the, Patty Brown, all the people that they were treating, and um, all the firemen from Ladder 3 were killed. And uh, I ran into a guy I knew as we were coming down the stairs who was the chief aide from the 2nd Battalion. And uh, he was, uh, he was just standing in the doorway. and. Uh, I said, his name is Faustino Apostle. I said, hey, Faust, let's go. It's time to go. And he said, that's all right, Cap. I'm waiting for the chief. And he was the aide to Chief McGovern. And uh, Chief was his partner. And he was waiting for his partner. And uh, he didn't leave him. And both he and the chief were killed in the collapse. So we continued down the stairs and uh, ran into Mike Warcola, who was a lieutenant in Ladder 5, who was scheduled to retire the next day. And uh, he and a couple of his firemen from Ladder 5 were working on a civilian in the stairway. And uh, it, it was a, um, you know, I, I approached him, I said, Mike, let's go, it's time to go. He said, that's all right, Jay, you have your civilian, I have mine, and we'll be right behind you. And I said something like, oh, don't take too long. 
And uh, as we continue down the stairs, um, uh, we get to the 10th floor and beginning to allow myself the luxury of thinking that we might get out of here. We might get, get to the ground floor. And uh, so uh, I'm starting to feel good. I'm starting to feel confident until we got to the fourth floor. And that's when Josephine Harris fell to the floor. And she started yelling at us to leave her alone. Don't touch her. Leave me. And uh, I wasn't thrilled with Josephine at this point. Uh, because we just carried her down from the 20th floor. And now she's saying to leave her alone. So I broke into the fourth floor to look for a sturdy chair that we could put her on and carry her with him, her in the chair. And the fourth floor was not an office floor, it was a mechanical equipment room floor. So I was running, I was on the way on the other side of the building. And the, the footprint of, the, uh, World Tra of the, each of the two towers of the World Trade Center was one acre in area. And uh, so I'm way on the other side of the building. And something just told me, says, you know what? So this isn't, isn't working out, we're gonna have to drag her down the stairs. And uh, so I go running back and I got about three or four feet away from the, uh, from the stairway door and it starts the collapse of the North Tower with us still inside it. And uh, I was able to open the stairway door and I dove for the stairway and uh, I covered up as best I could. And uh, stairway was a bunch of different sensations. Um, the, uh, each of the towers is 1,350 feet in height. So, and that's, it started from the top down, the collapse. So as the collapse got closer and closer and closer, it got louder and louder, and the vibrations would get more violent. For every time a floor would hit another floor, we'd be bouncing up and down off the floor. And um, you could hear the eerie sound of twisting steel, and uh, you could the uh, the collapse compressed the air what, what was left of the building, and it created very strong winds within the building. And uh, my Tillerman, Matt Kamarowski, was waiting for me on the fourth floor landing, and these winds were strong enough to pick him up and throw him down two flights of stairs. And uh, inside this wind was, it was peppered with debris, and, uh, and we were getting pummeled, just like, you know, a bunch of people are punching you at the same time. And uh, so we, uh, we covered up and you know, hope for the best, you know. One thing is the, uh, as, as anxious as I was before the collapse, once the collapse started, that anxiety went away. It was like, whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. And, uh, you know, I was, I was calm uh, after that. And um, so we, uh, you know, the collapse stopped and we were still alive. We were in complete darkness, and we heard, uh, um, I heard other people coughing and gagging, and we're trying to get debris out of our mouths, our, our eyes, our ears, our noses. And uh, so uh, the, um, so I says, all right, some people are still here. And I gave out a roll call, and all my people were accounted for. I said, what about the woman? And uh, Billy Butler says, yeah, she's right here. She's right in my face. So, uh, um, so we, uh, you know, we're th our thought process was, all right, let's dust ourselves off and continue down the stairs. But word quickly came up from uh, Matt Kamarowski that we couldn't get out that way. And um, so we're there, we're trapped. And uh, as, uh, Shortly after the collapse stopped, I, I got a Mayday message over the radio from Lieutenant Mike Warcola. He said he was trapped on the, uh, in the B stairway on the 12th floor, and he's trapped and he was hurt badly. And uh, one of my guys turns to me, Sal D'Agostino, he says, Cap, did you get that? I said, yeah, I got it. And uh, so I started heading up the stairs. And the stairs are there. But they're um, they're twisted, they're rubber filled, they got holes in it. You know, you have to use a banister to climb up it. And uh, 
but they're there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to move debris to, to climb. And I got to the fifth floor and Mike transmitted a second in May Day. He was a little bit more distraught the second time. And I make it to the half landing between the fifth and the sixth floor. I'm trying to move the debris. Now it's too heavy. I can't move it. And he transmitted a third May Day. And it was helpless. I couldn't, I couldn't move the debris anymore. It was too heavy. And I just got on the radio and said, I'm sorry, Mike, I can't help you. And uh, so I start heading down the stairs and uh, we're trapped. You know, we're, uh, we're trapped in the rubble in the stairway. And uh, so we're trying to, you know, we're in darkness. We're breathing in this dust and uh, we could hear fires outside. And uh, we're still trying to figure out how to get out. And once I realized, you know, it was a little bit of a mental leap for a fireman to take. Because usually we're on the other side of the equation. Usually we're the ones who are running in to get somebody, not the ones that were asking for help from, from the outside. I realized that we were helpless and we needed help. And I transmitted my own May Day. And uh, I got a, a I got an acknowledgement fairly quickly from uh, Deputy Chief Tom Haring from the 6th Division. And uh, he said, okay, ladder six, we have you written down. You're in the North Tower B stairway, fourth floor. I says, okay, things are looking up. And uh, so we're, we're trapped and, you know, all of a sudden I, I start getting uh, radio transmissions from guys who are not only some of the most talented guys I know, but some of them, some of my closest friends uh, heard from John Salka from the 18th Battalion. And he and I uh, came on the fire department together and I'm, we studied together and I'm godfather to one of his sons. You know, and he says, you know, is this Jay Jonas? He says, yes. All right, where are you? And I would say North Tower, B Stairway, fourth floor. Not knowing, not even having a clue what it looks like outside. You know, we're in our little hole a rubble enclosed hole and uh, you know we're thinking that the whole building couldn't have collapsed because we're alive you know that uh, and we, Mike Warkolis we passed him on the 12th floor and his May Day said he was on the 12th floor so we're just taking inputs and this is well maybe half the building collapsed you know and uh, so we're uh, we're trapped and I'm hearing um, I heard Captain Ralph Tizo, the captain of Rescue 3, calling for a hand line because he was cut off by fire trying to find us. And uh, I heard from uh, uh, my neighbor, Cliff Stabner, who was a fireman of Rescue 3, and he'd get on the radio and says, uh, Rescue 3 to Ladder 6, Captain Jay Jonas, this is Cliff. I'm coming to get you. Where are you? And he'd ask me a series of questions. And he would end every conversation by saying, I'm coming for you, brother. I'm coming for you, which was the only time they got me emotional uh, while I was trapped was every time he said that. And every time he said it, it was kind of like, geez, I'm not worthy of this. There's got to be somebody else who's in a worse predicament than I am. But as it turns out, we're, ours were the only radio messages getting out that uh, uh, you have this massive site, this 16 acre site and you're, you're, you're trying to figure out where to start digging. And all right, let's focus on that. You know, we know he's alive. Let's try to find him. And uh, so uh, all this time, like, you know, like I said before, this would be my last response as the captain of Ladder 6 and um, because I'd get promoted five days later. And uh, it was a place I was very, very much involved with and um, I was so proud of my guys that they took it upon themselves to take care of Josephine Harris without orders from me. They did it on their own. You know, this is their, uh, this is their compassion and, uh, you know, their, their self-imposed discipline. They, um, you know, at one point we had a, an explosion that happened outside the stairway and it caused a secondary collapse in the stairway and pieces of debris were falling. And uh, Mike Meldrum, my senior guy, rolled his body on top of Josephine's to shield her from the debris. 
And then when it, the collapse stopped, my youngest member, Sal D'Agostino, uh, took off his fireman's coat, his, his bunker coat, and uh, put it on her. And he, he told her, he says, listen, as long as we're here, nothing is going to happen to you. We're going to protect you. You know, this was an impossible situation for her as well as it was us. But at least we're used to being in touchy situations. And obviously she wasn't. And uh, it was like right after that secondary collapse, you know, it's the only time she lost her composure. She started saying she was scared. And uh, I just looked down at her and I said, look, we're all a little scared, darling. And it's just, just hang in there. And she did. You know, she was a brave lady. And... Um, so the hours are clicking by, you know, we're, and I'm talking to guys on the radio. I spoke to a friend of mine, Nick Visconti, and uh, he was running the rescue operation to try to find us. And he asked me a battery of questions. And, uh, you know, he would ask me questions. says, geez, why is he asking me that? But there was always a method behind his madness. Uh, he, would, he didn't know how much we knew. How about how bad it was, how bad our situation was, but he, he uh, uh, but he still needed information because they, they they couldn't even find the footprint of the building. The, you know, guys who worked down there for years would be in the middle of the pile. And says, ah, I'm not sure where I am, and uh, so uh, at one point he asked me, he says, uh, "All right, were you near? Uh, was your apparatus parked near ladder 110?" I said, I don't know. There's a lot of red fire trucks when we pulled up. And uh, so, uh, but the reason he asked me that was because they found a lot of 110's fire truck. And they, 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 they wanted to orient themselves as to where to start looking for us. He says, all right, I'm not too sure how, about the building. Can you tell us how you got in the building? I said, all right, we, we came in off of West Street, through the glass doors, made a right, and you first left the B stairways right there. You can't miss it. And thinking that, like only half of our building fell off. And uh, he said that he was surrounded by maybe a hundred firemen who were getting ready to pounce on a rescue routine to uh, to try to find us. When I said we went through the glass doors, he was, uh, <laughs> he said there was a collective moan that went off. There wasn't a piece of glass that was intact for a couple blocks. So uh, it was, um, we kept waiting, kept, kept looking for a sign. And um, all of a sudden that sign came between the fourth and fifth hour of our entrapment. A little sliver of light came into the stairway and it illuminated the stairway. And we were trapped, we, had, we were trying to save batteries, we were trying to save our flashlights, trying to save our radios. We were using only one radio. And uh, this little sliver of light came through and uh, what happened was the smoke and dust cleared outside and allowed the sunshine to hit the stairway. There was a little opening through the rubble and we could see, I could look up, I could see blue sky, which was uh, amazing to me that, you know, I said to my guys, there used to be 106 floors above our heads, now I see blue sky. I said, I think we're on top of the World Trade Center. And uh, so, we started with this new light. We were able to find an area in, in our little hovel there that we could uh, breach through the rubble and, and get outside, get into the outside the, the rubble. And now where we are, the way the building collapsed, we were kind of, the B stairway was in the center of the building. So everything else kind of fell away. So we're actually higher than the rest of the rubble. And, uh, we had a battalion chief who was trapped with us, Rich Picciotto, who wanted to go out first. So we tied him off. And I says, all right, make contact. We saw a fireman off in the distance. Make contact with that fireman. And once you make contact with him, tie your rope, the rope off there, and we'll tie it off here. I'll start sending people out. They can hold on to the rope and then walk down the rubble, which is what we did. And uh, the firemen that w were uh, approached were um, firemen from... NG-53 and Ladder 43 in Harlem, and they were led by Lieutenant Glenn Rowan. And uh, uh, the, um, 
he, he made it to the stairway. By the time he made it to the stairway, I had most of the people out. You know, the engine 39 was below us. They had uh, a lieutenant who was w waiting to see two of his guys, guys freed. They were, uh, uh, it was James F. Diamatis and, and Jeffrey Coniglio. They were, they just fell through a, um, a stairway landing. And, uh, but I, we introduced Glenn Rowan to Josephine Harris and we said, all right. Here's Josephine, she wasn't walking before the collapse, she's not walking now. And uh, he said, okay. I said, so you're gonna need some fresh firemen and a Stokes basket stretcher to carry her out. So okay. I told him about, we were talking to uh, Battalion Chief Richard Prunty and uh, we hadn't heard from him in well over an hour. He was, every time we spoke to him, uh, he was going at the shock and we couldn't get to him. And he said, all right. And I says, oh yeah, early in the collapse, uh, we had a May Day from Mike Warcola, the lieutenant from Ladder 5. He said he was on the 12th floor in the B stairway. And he just gave me a funny look. I says, why the look? He says, you'll see. And it, the look was that the 12th floor didn't exist anymore. And uh, so the rest of my guys started to leave. Sal D'Agostino left the stairway. And then Tommy Falco left and he came back in. I says, hey, Cap, where do you get a look at this? And uh, I poked my head out of the rubble and uh, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I saw number seven World Trade Center on fire. Number four, five and six World Trade Center, those seven story buildings, they were on fire. Uh, all you could see was the uh, facade of what was left of the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And um, it was, uh, it was unbelievable. It's like we just got bombed, and we did. You know, they used the uh, fully fueled aircraft as bombs. And uh, so now we start making our way across the rubble field, and we start heading towards West Street. And the reason why we want to go to West Street is that's where the ambulances were. I felt that once my people made it to West Street, they were going to be okay. But now West Street is about 30 feet above where we were. <laughs> They had to drop down ropes to us so we could walk on the rubble and climb up the rope hand over hand and make it to West Street. And uh, that was the most satisfying part of the day for me was watching my people make it to West Street one by one. And uh, two of my guys were taken to hospitals right away, uh, Matt Komarowski and Billy Butler. And uh, finally I waited to, to, the, to the end and it was just uh, me and Mike Meldrum, my senior guy. And he says, Cap, I can't, I can't climb the rope. And I say, yeah, you can, Mike, go ahead, climb the rope. And he, he was injured. He, I think he had a concussion going on. He had something going on with his back. He's dehydrated, you know, he's banged up. He says, I, I can't. And I had to, you know, trying to convince him to go, I had to think on my feet. And I says, hey, Mike, you see that hill? Uh, he says, yeah. So your wife and kids are on the other side of the hill, climb the rope. And he did found the strength and the courage to uh, overcome his pain and he climbed the rope. And uh, then uh, I climbed it and uh, I said, all right, well, where's the command post? And they said, forget about the command post. The ambulances are over there. I said, you don't understand. There's hundreds of guys looking for me right now. If one of those guys gets hurt after I'm out, I won't be able to live with myself. So, um, so all right, the command post is down by Liberty Street. And the, the command post is now a fire department pumper that's still hooked up to a hydrant and some paint is burned off of it and there's two chiefs on the roof of the, the pumper so they can see across the debris field and there's a couple hundred firemen around the base of the pumper and uh, it took me a, a couple minutes but I finally got the attention of the chiefs on the roof and one of them was Chief Hayden who uh, was the chief that ordered me to go upstairs and he looks down at me and I looked up at him and we both started crying at the same time and he says, Jay, it's good to see you. I said, well, it's, it's good to be here. I said, my guys are shot, we're, we're, we're done. He said, all right, go, go to the ambulance, just get out of here, you know, and uh, which is what we did. And uh, that's pretty much a snapshot of the day. Well, um, the people that uh, I was directly responsible for all, all lived, which was uh, a blessing, you know, if, if one of them got killed or seriously injured, you know, I probably wouldn't be 
Uh, it's still be uh, reliving that day over and over and over again. Um, but you know, there are many of my uh, friends and colleagues who uh, were full of life and uh, would do anything for anybody. And they, over their careers, they proved that. And uh, they are no longer with us. And uh, the world is a lot worse off by them not, not being around. Well, the, um, it's a, a landmark date, 20 years. So uh, that commands respect and time to honor that day uh, and uh, reflect upon um, what, uh, you know, the, the loss of those guys. But as time goes on, I, I tend to remember um, what they did before the collapses occurred. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I gave a, um, a speech once at um, Burke Catholic High School. Uh, they had a teacher there, Mary Alberino, who would bring me in and talk to her class. And in the class was the, uh, the child of a, of a fireman that was killed. And it's, she wants to meet you before the, before the presentation. I said, okay. And uh, I shook hands with her I, and uh, you know, the, we introduced each other. And uh, she, I told her, I says, you know, your dad was a hero. And she, she rolled her eyes and I was like, no, you don't understand. Your dad was a hero, not because he died. It's for what he was doing before he was killed. And uh, there was, you know, I was never so proud to be a fireman as I was that day that uh, under the most absolute extreme conditions, the guys were still functioning. They were still trying to save people's lives and put fires out and rescue people and remove them from an attack on our country that we hadn't seen, you know, really, you can't even say it was like Pearl Harbor because Pearl Harbor wasn't a state then. Uh, was the last time the mainland got attacked since I think the War of 1812. Um, so, uh, you know, so we were the first line of defense for the United States, you know, the firemen and policemen that day, uh, who functioned at the World Trade Center. Uh, more people died at the World Trade Center than died at Pearl Harbor. Just the World Trade Center alone, you know, so, uh, it's, uh, but as I, at the 20 year anniversary, I'm going to reflect upon what I know and what I saw the guys doing under the most extreme circumstances. So. Well, it's a solemn day. I usually go to a uh, memorial service in the city that day, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll go to one of the firehouses uh, uh, that had significant life loss. So I'll have, there'll be uh, family members there, and uh, we'll have lunch. and. Uh, um, and that's pretty much it. You know, I, I honor the day. I, I, I reflect on the guys and uh, what they did that day. And uh, like I said, it's a solemn day.